rest of us, part two's story has been incredibly divisive for many reasons, whether it's the order of the story, seemingly convenient plot points, questionable character choices, Joel dying too early, blah, 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 blah. It's not a bad story. It's okay. Nobody knows a story better than the ones who create them, but sometimes those stories can be lost in translation, or in this case, lost in presentation. That is what hurts this story the most. Not Joel dying, not uncomfortable sex scenes, not contrived character choices, although that didn't help, but the structure. The way it is makes it hard to sell those tough pills to everybody, and that is exactly what happened with part two. There was wasn't enough time to humanise Abby or make her relatable enough before killing Joel. As it stands, the story aims to misdirect the player's emotions early on with the hope to bring them back as you play as Abby, but at the risk of never being able to get players back on the same wavelength by the end. For many people, including myself, it wasn't able to do that. Abby destroys her chances at fully earning the empathy Naughty Dog wanted her to receive, especially being a completely new character. What's more, Abby doesn't show any struggle or remorse for anything she has done, whereas Ellie is plagued, which unfortunately contradicts Revenge Doesn't Heal, because it clearly does. Something about the way it's told or ordered denies players the chance to distribute empathy equally between Ellie and Abby in preparation for such a dramatic shift in the world of The Last of Us. What could have been reworked is a completely different video and not entirely fair to the writers. I respect their work regardless of whether I like it or not. It is what it is and we got what we got instead. What I want to share with you is a concept for an entirely different sequel, one that I came up with shortly after completing The Last of Us Part 2. It keeps many of the same themes and symbolism and aims to humanise Abby more naturally earlier on. Now remember, this is just an idea I came up with, not a The Last of Us Part 2 sucks, here's what they should have done. I am in no way a writer, let alone somebody who could capture even a slither of what made the first Last of Us story as magical as it was. But let's try anyway. The setup! All the characters from part two are here, and yes, it's cliche that Joel and Ellie would be together again, but just roll with it, because there is actually a good reason why they should be. Just like in part two, you'd play as Ellie, and flashbacks are no longer flashbacks, but in chronological order. Okay, let's begin. Abby dies. <laughs> okay, for real this time. Abby kills Tommy after mistaking him for Joel, and she becomes aware of that shortly after the final blow. A patrol group from Jackson searching for Tommy arrives. The group are flustered right after they hear Ellie calling out Joel's name. Abby's eyes widen. She's guilt-ridden, speechless, distraught. This isn't what she wanted. This isn't what was supposed to happen. We hate Abby, and for good reason, but showing her humanity, especially early on, is key to getting players to understand that everyone in this universe has a story and emotions. Her friends help her escape as they notice the backup from Jackson searching for Tommy getting closer. A note or item with the WLF logo is found on the floor in the same room, dropped while Abby's group fled. Joel, fueled by anger and sadness, swears to avenge his brother by hunting down everybody involved. This gives us a chance to create plot points that play on two mindsets. Joel is willing to do whatever it takes in his mind to make things right, and Ellie, who wants revenge, but not at the cost of Joel's morality. It makes room, allowing for contrast with their dynamic from the first game. After a night of meaningful conversation between the two, Ellie tells Joel she's joining him. The partnership parallels the first game, but the relationship is tested with the differences in their methods. As a reminder, Joel isn't a bad person. He's done bad things, but that doesn't define who he is. This is a prime example of that. His intentions are to do right by his brother, but at a moral cost. This is the same Joel from the first game. This is the same Joel that made that choice at the hospital, just this time 
We aren't Joel. We are Ellie looking in from the outside. Ellie and Joel work their way through the group, taking revenge on everybody involved. Seems like the Nora Ellie scene can be kept the same, seeing as Joel can't go down into the spores, making for a more interesting interaction between the two at the end of that scene questions surrounding the morality of vengeance is predominant. Both Ellie and Joel question what they're doing, but Joel can't leave. He just can't. At some point, they find a guitar. Ellie plays it, having been taught by Joel in the past. Joel listens to Ellie's playing as he's cast deep into thought. When Ellie's finished, Joel reminds her that they need to get a move on, but Ellie, once again, questions the morality of what they're doing. Only this time, Joel isn't having it. A heated argument starts and ends with Ellie dropping the guitar on the floor and leaving the room. Joel is left alone standing there as he stares at the guitar. At three quarters of the way through the game, they must fight the giant infected from part two known as the Rat King. Though they defeat it, Joel is bit by the infected that separates from it during the fight. This is when Ellie's immunity to the virus is highlighted as her curse. She cannot pass it on. She again has no choice, no say in what happens. Joel's choice from the first game is eternalized. Over the course of the game, his pain increases and the infection slowly worsens. Ellie pushes them, pleads them to turn back and begs to get it sorted out in a panic, but they're too close for Joel to stop now. Ellie and Joel eventually find Abby after fighting the WLF to reach her. Abby takes Ellie hostage with a gun aimed at Joel. It is then that the truth is revealed to the player that Abby's father was the surgeon from the first game. Because her friends have also been taken from her, she threatens to kill Ellie. This is it. This is the player's soft spot. This is the person we've held close for seven years. And this is the final fight. And for this fight, we play as Joel. The motivation to protect Ellie floods like electricity to the player, like a hit of nostalgia from the first game. Ellie bites Abby the same way she does in part two, symbolizing that infected aren't the only monsters who bite back. In a very dark and tough fight, Joel defeats Abby. But how do we get the player to sympathize with the villain? Through the main characters. Abby, struggling to breathe, pulls out her father's firefly pendant to be close to her father in her final moments, drawing a parallel to the watch Sarah gave to Joel. It's bitter. Any chance for catharsis has been taken away. The camera slowly pans behind Joel with Abby still in shot over his shoulder. A choice appears on screen. Finish what we started or let everything we've been through all be for nothing. This choice doesn't actually alter how the game ends, but that's exactly how it should be. Despite what you pick, the end of the game is still the same. It's a commentary on how pointless Vengers is in this cruel world. But if the choice doesn't change the ending, why give a choice at all? It's an opportunity. An opportunity that allows the player to speak to Joel. To give him the advice he needs to hear at that moment. Advice that we have to give him. It gives the player the opportunity to reflect on their own morals rather than Joel's morals in the narrative. Regardless of what the player picks, Joel falls to the ground. The infection has worsened. Ellie and Joel make haste back to Jackson before the infection can fully take over Joel's body. The only catch, there's only one shortcut. As Ellie and Joel reach the exact place the lie began, overlooking Jackson, Joel falls to the ground. 
Ellie, with tears in her eyes, shouts at Joel to get up. But Joel knows it's no use. They both know it's no use. Ellie and Joel's relationship is at its most pure and rawest we have seen it between the two games. Joel tries to make light of the situation by telling a sarcastic joke, but it's just a cover. They both know what needs to be done. Ellie can't do it, but forces herself for Joel. Just before, Ellie pauses and looks at Joel. I forgive you. Joel looks up at her, tears in his eyes, and smiles before closing his eyes. The camera slowly pans backwards, the two still in frame with Jackson in the distance. What happens next can either be the credits or taken right from the farm scene in part two with Dina, Ellie and JJ with a few changes. They're trying to move on and start a new life, Tommy isn't an asshole, and Ellie plays Joel's song as the credits roll. <laughs> <laughs> 